let's continue our discussion of axiomatic considerations in the context of voting mechanisms and we are just uh, at a point where we have realized that sometimes even fairly innocent looking requirements can land you in a bit of a soup so uh, in particular we saw that asking for unanimity and independence of irrelevant alternatives actually leaves you only with the dictatorial voting rule which i think most of us would agree is not a good situation to be in but that is sort of the mathematical reality that we have to wrestle with um, do you have any suggestions for how to deal with this situation um, we seem to have a result which tells us that there isn't a good voting mechanism. Um, very roughly translated. So, uh, is I mean, at this point, since some of this is also, I mean, we decided that we wanted independence of irrelevant alternatives. All of this is up for debate. So, are there any uh, remarks or suggestions? So first of all, I'm not going back to the proof. Was there anything that requires a clarification or if there were any questions, then we could discuss that as well. So even if all the details are not transparent, hopefully the overall idea is clear, which is to say that you find a pivotal voter for a particular candidate. Uh, use unanimity and IIA to derive certain properties of polarizing candidates and we had that trick where we had a sequence of profiles which we used to identify the pivotal voter for a particular candidate and then we said that this pivotal voter is in fact decisive for all pairs of candidates not involving the polarizing candidate and finally we had a short observation for why this also works for pairs of candidates involving the polarizing candidates. So those were sort of the steps in the proof um, and I'm confident that if you go back and look at it once more it will be reasonably clear. It turns out that this theorem has several different proofs which use several different approaches. Uh, if you're interested in a slightly different approach you can also look at the handbook uh, which we are referring to um, you can find it in the references section of the website for the school. Uh, in the very first chapter, they introduce Arrow's theorem and they have, um, they have a slightly different approach where they essentially say that you can, if a, if a collection of voters is decisive for a pair, which is to say that if all of these voters say that A over B, then, uh, well, a collection of voters is said to be decisive for a pair. If, if these voters say A over B, then the mechanism outputs A over B. So unanimity is basically saying that the entire cohort of voters is decisive, right? Because if the entire cohort of voters, everybody says A over B, then the mechanism outputs A over B. That is the unanimity principle. And dictatorship basically says that there is a single voter that is decisive for all pairs A, B. Right? That, in fact, we don't even need a, a non-trivial cohort that a single voter is decisive. So the main lemma there is to say that if you give me a collection of voters that is decisive, I can split it into two smaller collections, at least one of which is decisive. That is really the key lemma that they prove. And once you have that, it is not hard to see that you can use unanimity to get a starting collection of voters and then you keep splitting it into smaller and smaller pieces until you end up with one voter. So that is the approach there. It's slightly different, but it's also worth going through. It's a, uh, it's a manageable proof. Um, and if you look it up online, you will find several other approaches um, to this theorem. It really is is fairly fundamental and has been uh, revisited in several contexts. We won't really uh, be getting into the various offshoots. It's kind of beyond the scope of this discussion. But uh, there are two major reactions to a statement of this kind. I mean, the first natural reaction that a lot of people have is to say that independence of irrelevant alternatives um, is something that is rather strong and that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't demand it it's it's too much uh, the other the other thing is to go back to the setting of the theorem which looks at ranked ballots and you might say well 
um, our setting is social welfare functions, which takes a collection of rankings and outputs a ranking. And you might want to relax that and say that, well, what about other settings that are equally relevant, but may have more reasonable outcomes in terms of admitting reasonable mechanisms. So, so those are the two things um, that immediately come to mind. Is there anything else that you would like to suggest? So, okay, the first thing that I said about debating the axiom, I'm going to not get into that very much, but uh, in fact, Independence of Irrelevant Alternatives has a nice Wikipedia page where there are lots of examples for a lot of otherwise reasonable voting rules that violate the axiom. So you can actually look at it and you can also see a lot of references to critiques of the axiom. So if you're interested, um, uh, that's some nice, uh, background reading that you can catch up on. So independence of irrelevant alternatives is debated, not only because it leads to uh, this sort of an impossibility result, which is very stark, but also on its own right, I mean, not everybody agrees that that is something that we should necessarily demand, and that the role of a third voter can be critical when it comes to determining the, the ordering between two other alternatives. So that's uh, it's more of a subjective discussion, and we are not going to go down that path right now. The other thing that one might ask is, well, for social welfare functions, yes, we are, we are stuck in this mess. What about other sorts of mechanisms that um, aggregate preferences? So in particular, um, let's just consider what we said we will start with, which is, okay, I erased the wrong word, but so social choice functions. Again, there are two related notions. I mean, if you want to allow for ties, then you might want to output a subset of candidates. Okay. But we are going to be thinking about resolute voting rules, as they are called, which is basically that they take a call and output a single winner um, when they are given a collection of rankings. Yeah. So these are called social choice functions. So the output is a single candidate rather than a ranking. And frequently in many applications, this is also what we are interested in. We want to elect a winner or a leader, or we want to figure out where we want to go for dinner. So uh, this is uh, not an unreasonable relaxation to consider. Um, and let's investigate social choice functions for some time. So in this setting, things like unanimity and IIA uh, don't really make sense in the way that we have stated them because, okay, why do they not make sense in the way that we have defined them? So what would it mean for a social choice function to be unanimous? I mean, if you just read the definition out to yourself, you'll see that it doesn't type check, right? I mean, you are saying that the function must output A over B, but the function is not even giving you a ranking, so it doesn't make sense to talk about A over B. And it's the same problem with independence of irrelevant alternatives, right? So since we are not talking about rankings here, these are not the axioms that quite make sense. Um, so. However, the mechanism of dictatorship can be naturally adapted to the single winner setting. Um, so when would you say that a social choice function is a dictatorship? So one way of stating Arrow's theorem is to say that there is no social welfare function that simultaneously satisfies the following three properties. The first being unanimity, the second being IIA, and the third being the property of being non-dictatorial, meaning that the mechanism is not a dictatorship. So interpreting, so the first two properties don't carry over to the setting. The third property of being non-dictatorial can be reasonably adapted is what I'm suggesting. So what does it mean to be a dictatorship for a social choice function? 
Right. So you output the top choice of a fixed voter. So again, the the philosophy is that you are, or, or the spirit of the definition is that you are always following what one voter is asking you to do. So there is a voter such that on all profiles, the choice of the winner is essentially the top choice of this voter. That is when you say that you have a dictatorship. Okay. So that is one property that we are certainly interested in. We want a mechanism which is um, not dictatorial. Uh, the let's go back to considering some other properties that that we may want, right? So, one property that may be reasonable to demand, the property of being on to. So, what does it mean to say that a function is subjective, or or on to? You have seen this definition before, right? So, what does it mean to say that a function is subjective? I'll just request somebody, some of the quieter ones, to maybe volunteer. What does it mean to say that a cho social choice function is on to? You already know what it means in general for a function to be on to. It just means that every element in the range has a pre-image in the function. So translated in the language of social choice functions where the elements in the range are alternatives and the elements in the domain are profiles, how would you state this property? So all I'm asking for is a natural language way of talking about what it means for a social choice function to be on to. Is the, is the question clear? So the range of the function has size n, but that's still a fairly technical way of putting it. What does it mean intuitively in the context of voting? All of them have to appear once. Okay, so every candidate does appear in every ranking and every profile because we have assumed that the profile consists of n linear orders and linear orders are essentially complete rankings over all the candidates. So that we don't even have to request for this explicitly because that anyway happens. Every candidate appears in every ranking. They may not appear at the top spot for example or you know, um, uh, yeah, so, so, but they do appear. Uh, but what we are saying here is that, as you said, the range of the function is n. What does that mean? So, okay, let's just write out what it means for a function to be on to. So, we say for every element in the range of the function, there exists an element in the domain of the function such that, so let me just say for so for every element in the range there is an element in the domain such that the function maps y to x. Sorry? Right, okay, so range is already defined as, so that's a good point. Right? So we just say, so the way I wrote it, I mean, if you think of the range as just being the image of f, which is how it is usually defined. Um, the previous definition was a tautology and kind of trivial. So every, so everything in the codomain has a pre-image. So the range is the codomain. That's what we want to say. Right. 
Okay. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, for us, what is the codomain of the function? So, we are looking at f, which is a social choice function. So, the codomain is alternatives. And the domain is, what is the domain? Permutations of candidates, yeah, so a collection of uh, n permutations of the candidates which we would typically call a profile. So that's a voting profile. Uh, it's a collection of rankings over the candidates. So, yeah. so if you just read this out again, this just says that for every alternative there is a profile in which it is winning. Because for f of y to be equal to x translates as x is a winner. in the profile y. I mean, of course, as declared by f. I mean, f says that x wins in this profile. So to say that a social choice function is onto is to simply say that every candidate has a chance of winning. I mean, this is how I would put it informally, that every candidate has a shot at winning. Is this a reasonable property to demand from a social choice function? Yeah. I mean, if a social choice function didn't satisfy this property, then there is some candidate for whom this is a completely meaningless game, right? They, they would not be invested in participating at all if they knew that there was absolutely no scenario in which they would emerge as the winner. And as rational people, we play to win. So if you, if you, if the mechanism itself is not giving you a chance, then that seems quite unfair, right? Okay. So, uh, so on to is reasonable. I mean, we are not even demanding very much. We are not saying that every candidate has a substantial chance of winning or a decent chance of winning. We're just saying that it has some chance of winning, some non-zero chance. It could be very slim, but so so it's uh, it's in fact a pretty weak. Uh, demand and I think therefore it is reasonable. So, um, so we would like our mechanisms to be on to. Yesterday we spent some time talking about manipulation or cheating strategies. So, I want to continue that discussion in the context of the axiomatic setting. So, if you wanted to frame um, non manipulability as a property, how would we do it? That also is something that seems like a reasonable ask. So this is called strategy proofness in the literature. This just means not being vulnerable to manipulative behavior. Yeah. So, how do we formalize strategy proofness? What do you want to um, What do you want to say here? So, essentially, what is manipulation and the way that we discussed it yesterday, we said that if it's possible for a voter to change their preference and obtain an outcome that works out better for them, then they have an incentive to actually report a fake preference, right? So if you change your preference and the outcome improves with respect to your true preference, then that would mean that 
you would actually be tempted to report a preference that's different from your truthful preference, right? So let's try to capture that. So we want to say that, well, since we are defining strategy proofness, maybe I should say that there does not exist any voter There does not exist a voter and let's say a pair of candidates for which what? So we want to avoid a situation where there is There is a profile P where the mechanism, so the mechanism F is giving us A. So say there is a profile Q where the mechanism is giving us B. And what makes this situation capture the notion of manipulation? First of all, how are P and Q related? So I want to say that I want to say that we want to avoid this scenario, right? To define strategy proofness. It should not be the case that there are two profiles P and Q, one on one of which the mechanism outputs A, and on the other the mechanism outputs B. When does this when does the setting actually become a valid manipulation scenario? How do you want the two profiles to be related, first of all? Sorry? They are, okay, so um, I want to connect the profiles with respect to the voter I because I'm thinking of I as the manipulative voter, right? So I want to say that these profiles are completely identical except for the vote of the voter I, okay? So the ith voter may have a different ordering here. It would have a different ordering because if everything else is identical, then uh, the outcome cannot change if something does not change. So, but nobody else has a different vote, okay? Everyone else is voting in the same way, but I has changed her preference. And how do we want A and B to be related? When does this constitute a valid manipulation? So for example, if in the true preference of I, B is ranked below A, would you consider this a manipulative scenario? If B is ranked below A, would the voter I be tempted to move to the profile Q from the profile P? Not really, right? However, if B is ranked above A in the truthful preference of the voter I, right, then the voter I looks at the profile Q and says that, okay, if I changed my vote according to what is specified in the profile Q, then the mechanism appears to give me something that I like more than the current outcome, right? So, so B is preferred over A in the truthful vote of the voter I. So I'm using the word truthful here in a intuitive sort of sense. What I mean is that in the vote, in the vote that we have for voter I in the profile P, let's say that B is ranked ahead of A, which is to say that B is preferred over A. And in the profile P, the voter I sees that the output of the mechanism is the candidate A. And if the voter happens to be aware of the profile Q, 
where she knows that everything else is the same, all she has to do is change her vote to I prime, and that will compel the mechanism to output B, which is a different outcome that is preferred over the current outcome, then certainly we have created a scenario where there is temptation for the voter I to deviate from her current preference. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So I'm not writing this anymore formally. You would have to say there exist profiles P and Q, which are the same except for the vote of the voter I, where the output of the mechanism is A on the first profile and B on the second, and the voter I prefers B to A. So this is the property of strategy proofness. So are these two properties clear? The property of being onto and the property of being strategy proof. Yeah, you don't create manipulative scenarios and you give everyone a chance to win. That again seems like a perfectly reasonable uh, set of properties to expect. And again, let me make sure that So by the way, we have seen examples of violations of strategy proofness already. Um, we have seen that of course with plurality, it's not strictly uh, vulnerable to manipulation because you really can't do much with it except for getting your candidate to tie. So there the tie breaking rule becomes kind of crucial. Uh, so it is mildly vulnerable to manipulation. Uh, but we have seen that rules like Copeland at least can be manipulated. You can convince yourself that Boda can be manipulated and so on. But all of these rules are on to, meaning you can construct profiles where any particular candidate comes out on the top, right? Okay. Can you quickly think about if dictatorship is strategy proof and if dictatorship is on to? Okay, so if you've been reading, this is our second depressing result of the day. But uh, before we parse this, uh, can we just quickly sanity check that dictatorships are in fact strategy proof and on to? So why is a dictatorship on to? So let's say that you have a dictatorship where the first voter is a dictator and you have a candidate A. What is a profile where A emerges as a winner? Right, so any profile in which the first voter places A on the top, A emerges as a winner. So get the first voter to place A on the top and complete the rest of the profile in any way that you like. In all of these profiles, A will turn out to be the winner under the dictatorship rule. So in fact, there are many profiles in which A is winning. So uh, that would be on to. What about strategy proofness? 
does any voter have an incentive to deviate from their truthful preference? So what about the non-dictatorial voters? Do they have an incentive to deviate? If the mechanism is a dictatorship with the first voter being the dictator and you are not the first voter, then anything that you do is not going to influence the outcome of the election, right? So, so if you are not the first voter, then this situation will simply not arise. So what F was spewing out here was the top preference of the first voter. And in the profile Q, since no other vote has changed, in particular, the first voter's vote has also not changed. So that outcome will continue to be A, no matter how drastically you change your preferences. Okay. So other than trying to persuade the first voter or bribe the first voter, you cannot manipulate in the usual sense of manipulation. Right. Changing your voter will not make any difference. What about the dictatorial voter? Does she have an incentive to deviate from a truthful vote? Does the dictatorial voter have any reason to deviate from her truthful vote? No. Because the voting rule is anyway listening to her, so why should she throw a tantrum? It doesn't make any sense. So the dictatorial voter also has no reason to deviate. So a dictatorship is indeed strategy proof and on to. And if you have, again, at least three candidates, then this turns out to be the only mechanism that enjoys these two properties. Okay, so again, it's fairly stark. And I think in this context, we will have a slightly more elaborate discussion of what are the ways in which we can sort of um, deal with this situation. But before we do that, I think I want to again spend some time conveying some intuition about what is going on here, just like we did for IIA and unanimity. So again, we are wrestling with specific properties here. And let's see if we can at least make a few observations. And what I'll try and do is give you an illustration for why something like this may be true when there are only two voters. And I'll leave it as an exercise in induction to see that you can take whatever we have learned for two voters and then expand it out to a setting with more voters. Okay. So the monotonicity property basically says that if you have a profile, okay, where F is giving you the candidate A and the mechanism F is, so throughout we will assume that we are dealing with a strategy proof and onto mechanism because that's what we are interested in, right? So we want to look at the class of strategy proof and onto mechanisms and basically just like before say shrink that class to the dictatorships. You want to say that there is nothing else that can manage. So if F is strategy proof and onto, then if you go from a profile P to a profile Q where A's position either stays the same or improves for any voter. Okay, so A is winning currently and A only gets promoted or stays the same in the new profile, then A continues to win. Okay, that's what we want to say. So, Yeah, so this is called monotonicity. And 
And again, I'm going to pause here for a minute or two to allow for parsing. So is the, uh, is the claim clear if everyone either keeps A at the same position? So A is the current winner with respect to the profile P. And if everyone either stays, um, I mean, keeps A at the same rank or improves the rank of A, then A should not be dethroned as the winner. That seems like a very natural thing to expect. But again, you can think of examples of mechanisms where this may not be true if these assumptions do not hold. So we are saying, uh, we are saying that the mechanism, we are implicitly assuming that the mechanism is on to and strategy proof. I mean, I've not written it out, but that's, that's what we have. Okay, so just to prompt your line of thought, let's just start by saying that you have two profiles, P and Q. And I don't know if it is visible, but two profiles, P and Q, as specified in the statement of the lemma, where we go from P to Q um, in a way that we only improve the situation of the winner in the profile P. In fact, I'm going to make it even simpler and say, let's just consider two profiles P and Q where only the first voter's vote has changed, okay? So these profiles are, they satisfy the hypothesis of the, of the lemma, right? Uh, so in the first voter's vote, uh, let's say that that's the only vote that has changed and in a way that respects the position of A, meaning it keeps it either the same or improves it. And all the other votes are in fact the same. Let's just deal with this slightly simplified case. And for the sake of contradiction, let's assume that the output of the mechanism in fact changed to B from A, right? Now, based on the strategy proofness of the mechanism, can we derive a contradiction? So how do you think the first voter, so let's maybe call this preference V1. We call this preference U1. So how does V1 compare A and B? Do you think it's A over B or B over A? Keep in mind that the mechanism is strategy proof, right? Yeah, so, so V1 better like A over B 
because if not, then, okay, somebody at the back, what happens if not? Yeah, so then the voter V1 is tempted to deviate into the profile Q, right? Because if, if V1 likes B better than A, then she sees that she can change her vote to U1 and actually get B as the outcome, which would contradict the presumed strategy proofness of this mechanism, right? So it must in fact be that uh, A is preferred over B. And here we know that because of the assumption of the lemma again, A must be preferred over B because we said that A's ranking only improves or stays the same. So if A was ranked below B, then we've certainly not respected the requirement of the lemma, which is that A's ranking stays the same or improves. We know that B was ranked below A and now in the new vote, if a is ranked below B, then A has suffered a demotion for sure. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, given a pair of, so in, yeah, so in any pair of profiles, when you see that you can move from one to the other and obtain an improvement in the other profile with respect to the preference in the first profile, then you can interpret the first profile as being your true preference and then you can see that that leads to a manipulative situation. Right, so V1 has an incentive to manipulate uh, in the profile P because she can see that she can go to Q and obtain a better outcome. But you're right, there's nothing sacrosanct about P being a truthful profile and Q being a fake profile. That's a temporary status that we assign to the profiles to witness or explain that a manipulative situation has been created. So there are other places where you can also manifest manipulative behavior or scenarios. Um, in fact, can you see one here? Because with respect to Q, the mechanism is giving us B. And now if you consider again the first voter sitting in the profile Q, so this is like a frame of reference thing, um, you know, so with respect to the, in the profile Q, now you can see that U1 must be feeling a bit restless, no? because she likes A better than B in this profile. And what can she do? Does she have an opportunity to deviate in this picture? Right, if she goes back to the profile P, then she can extract the outcome A from the mechanism, which is actually a preferred outcome, right? So that tells us that the first voter of the profile Q has an opportunity to manipulate by going to the profile P if the mechanism outputs B here, which means that we contradicted the strategy proofness of the mechanism. And therefore, it cannot be that um, the outcome of F is different in the profile Q because this holds for any, any B different from A. So it must be that F of Q is also A. Yeah? Is that reasonable? So we have monotonicity. Which is So the second claim I want to make is about Pareto optimality. So let's say that this is sort of trying to transfer unanimity. So
So suppose we have a profile P where everyone prefers A over B. So remember that that's the unanimity setting that we were talking about in the context of social welfare functions. Uh, here what we want to say is that the, the candidate that is ranked lower between the two cannot actually win the election. Okay, that's a natural uh, analog of unanimity in the social choice setting. And we can in fact um, derive it from strategy proofness. So I forgot to say that for So if your function f is strategy proof and on to, which as I said will be something we assume throughout, then it is also unanimous in this sense. So again, let's pause here to think about why, why this would be true. So again, just to get you started, think along the lines of contradiction. Strategy proofness would mean that, yeah, in every profile for every voter, it is the case that there is no other profile where all the other votes are the same and her vote is different and the outcome of the mechanism is better than the current outcome. Sorry? And they can hope to change, yeah. So, so if, I mean, yeah, so no voter has no in, any incentive to deviate in any profile. Um, if you don't think about dictatorship, you're saying, uh, well, I mean, we are, of course, trying to prove that other than a dictatorship, such a mechanism doesn't exist. So, I mean, I'm sure what you're saying is correct, but I don't, I don't see it as transparently as you are. So, okay, let me just clarify what I mean, I guess. So, you have maybe the space of all profiles. Okay. So, this is just a rough sketch to illustrate what we mean by manipulation, it also perhaps, I mean, I was going to get to it at some point, but uh, it also perhaps will illustrate that although it sounds reasonable on the one hand, the property of man being strategy proof is actually in some sense also demanding. So let me just project my attention to all the profiles uh, from the point of view of a particular voter I, yeah, where all the other votes, let's just have an arbitrary but fixed choice for all the remaining voters' votes, okay. And let's just say that I's voters, uh, I mean, we are looking at all of these profiles where, so I have drawn five here, let me make another bar. So let's say there are six candidates and I'm focused on, so this could be A, B, C, this is ACB. So these are the six possible orderings that the voter I can have, okay? And the choice of the remaining voters is arbitrary but fixed. So there are, you will get a bunch of different slices like this if you focus on the voter I. Okay, so what I'm saying is that sitting inside any one of these profiles, okay, and looking at the outcome. So let's say here the mechanism outputs A, okay. There is no other profile in which the mechanism outputs B, for instance, right. 
because then voter I would have an incentive to change their vote accordingly and nobody else would have to do anything. She would not have to convince anyone else to join her uh, you know, strategic agenda because all the other votes are fixed to be the same. So manipulation is simply saying that if F outputs A here, then F should not output B on any of the profiles. If F outputs C here, then F cannot output A or B on any of the other profiles. But if F outputs B here, then F is free to do whatever it wants on the other profiles because whenever F outputs the top choice of any voter, the voter anyway does not have any incentive to deviate because she's getting her best option, okay? So this is what the property means, yeah? And I think what you were saying is that um, this, I mean, how, how can a voting rule manage to keep track of all this and uh, Yeah, so in every profile, there are always going to be M minus one losers, right? And there will presumably be voters who are rooting for them, who like them better than the current candidate, unless, unless the current candidate is really a hot favorite and is on the top spot for all the voters, which would be, which is probably what you were alluding to. So somebody, yes, it is true that for the M minus one losers, it is quite likely that there will be someone who is feeling bad about at least one of the losers and would want to move to a profile where they can make that person win. But what we want from the mechanism is that they should not have an opportunity to do so. So if the mechanism itself is such that it's kind of stingy about or it has so much structure that so for instance as we were saying here, if for instance in this profile, uh, you know, A was winning, uh, if the mechanism just outputs A or C on all the other profiles, at least the voter I does not have an incentive to change her vote, right? Uh, so basically what we are saying is this is one condition and you will, you know, basically based on what you decide to do on one profile, a lot of constraints will emerge, right? Right, but this is not the entire set of profiles. This is just six of the profiles that I've gotten by fixing uh, the remaining votes. If I change the remaining votes, I will get a whole bunch of other profiles. Remember the set of all profiles is, um, so six raised to the number of voters n, right? So, um, so there are very many more. I've just fixed on I fixated on six by fixing a choice for all the other voters' votes. But when I change those choices slightly, I will get another layer, I'll get another layer. So there are, I mean, many, many such slices. And I've given you the conditions for strategy proofness based on the slices generated by focusing on the voter I. If you focus on a different voter J, you will be slicing the space in a different way. You'll be getting a bunch of other slices and a whole bunch of other conditions, right? And these conditions are all in the form of, okay, if you decide to declare A as the winner here, then you should be careful about not declaring, you know, so-and-so as a winner in so-and-so profile. So you get a whole bunch of these conditions and any mechanism that manages to satisfy all of them is called a strategy proof mechanism. Exactly, yeah, yeah, so, right, I mean, so, first of all, losing candidates themselves cannot do anything, whatever they have to do would have to be via the voters who support them, because candidates don't even have um, votes to play around with, but if there is a losing candidate and there is a voter who, um, who is rooting for that losing candidate, as in this example, for instance, uh, for the voter, I, um, B is losing and B is actually her favorite candidate. So if she could help it, she would really like B to win. 
but in all the profiles she investigates all the other profiles that she can legitimately go to any of the other profiles that i've not highlighted here are not accessible because other voters have changed their votes she would have to knock on their doors and ask them to also change their votes we are only looking at the single voter manipulation case at the moment so these are the only profiles that she can actually access by changing her vote so these are the feasible profiles that she could move to but sitting on you know sitting in this island here looking at all the feasible profiles that are within her reach she sees that all of them are pretty futile no matter where she moves she is not going to be able to make b win and in fact in some of them uh, the outcome will become even worse from her point of view so she really might as well stay put yeah so does that address it in the way that you were indicating yeah this makes sense but yeah whatever we are going to be arguing now is going to be indicative of the fact that this really is too much for a mechanism to keep track of and that if it also wants to be on to then in fact it will not be able to be strategy proof at the same time but that does require an argument i mean it's not something that follows immediately but certainly if you relax on to ness uh, you can probably um, come up with non dictatorial mechanisms with a strategy proof i'll let you think about that for a bit So let's just come back to the issue of uh, unanimity as uh, seen in the context of choice functions. So what we were saying is that if a mechanism is strategy proof and onto then it also respects unanimity. Meaning that when everyone is saying A is better than B it doesn't go and pick B as the winner. Okay. And again let's try to um, I mean let's try to think of this by setting up a setting of i mean by setting up a contradictory situation so suppose the mechanism indeed screws up and decides to make b the winner in a profile where everyone is rooting for a over b let me just say one more thing and then pause to think because the mechanism is on to we know that a which is the candidate that we are fighting for must be winning somewhere i mean sadly it is not winning in the profile where it makes sense for it to win but because the mechanism is on to it's compelled to make a win somewhere right so there does exist a profile q which because of our assumption here is different from p where a is winning okay so i've set up these two profiles something that we derive immediately from um from onto ness now can we do some maneuvering to derive a contradiction again using the fact that so we haven't yet invoked strategy proofness but let's just stare at this for for a minute or so and then we will
So remember that we also have monotonicity where we said that if we promote everyone then the outcome does not change, right? Um, I don't know if I said that quite right. What I, what I meant to say was that monotonicity tells us that if you take a particular candidate and leave them alone or you promote them, and if they are already winning, then they continue to win. That's, that's what we want to say. So maybe let me just put this up for your consideration. Consider a profile where what we have done is we have dragged A and B to the top and the second positions. And for the rest of the candidates, we are just imitating the profile P. Okay. So essentially imagine just taking the profile P and in one step promoting A to the top position everywhere. And then in the second iteration promoting B to the second position in all the votes. So what can you say about the outcome in this profile? So what happens if you apply monotonicity with respect to P? So B was winning in P and all we did was we promoted candidates. Um, so in particular what we did was we promoted the winning candidate B up to the second position. So B's position, okay, so if you stare at P and this auxiliary profile that I've created R, the hypothesis of monotonicity was that the winning candidate's position has not become worse in any of the voters' votes. Is this true? This is true because um, B certainly did not have a first position with respect to any of the voters, right? Because we know that A is preferred over B by everyone, so B's best possible position was at the second spot for any voter. And what we have done is we have placed B at the second position in every voter's vote. So certainly B's position has not worsened with respect to any of the voters, yes? So the hypothesis for monotonicity does apply, which tells us that the output in R should be, should be B. If you apply monotonicity between P and R and look at the winning candidate in P, which is B, and realize that B has not suffered when we transition to R, we see that by monotonicity, which is a property guaranteed for any strategy proof and onto mechanism, uh, F must output B on the profile R. On the other hand, what else can we do? Remember that we are trying to drive a contradiction here, so what else can we uh, analyze? So along these lines, can we also say that F must output A on R, is there some reason for that? Because if that happens, we have our contradiction, we know that A and B are distinct candidates and F is a function and it must really um, make up its mind on what to do in R, right? 
sorry. So is there a reason that R must output A, let's say by monotonicity or any other reason that you can think? So unanimity is something that we are trying to prove. So we are trying to say that if, uh, so I suppose what you're saying is that if everyone places A on the top, then by unanimity, F should output A, which is a tempting thing to say, but we don't know that F is unanimous. All we know is that F is strategy proof and on to. So, but we do want to say that, I mean, that's a conclusion that we will, we will eventually derive. Would it be possible to apply monotonicity with respect to Q and R? We have already applied monotonicity between P and R to argue that B must emerge as the winner, right? Because we said that B's position does not deteriorate in any voter's vote when moving from P to R between the profiles P and R. So who is winning in Q? A is winning in Q. And can we say that A's position has not worsened in moving from Q to R? Yes? Why can we say that? Because A is in the top position, which is the best that you can hope for for any candidate, right? So A has... A has the best possible position in every voter's vote in R. So even if A was winning in Q because Q was very generous about putting A on the top for every voter, even then in R we have not made things worse. And if that was not the case in Q, if anything, we have improved A's situation with respect to every voter. Okay. Every voter that did not place A on the top now places A on the top. So. Certainly between Q and R, the movement for A has been in the positive direction. Right? So because A has the best, in absolute terms, the best possible position that it can enjoy for every voter, with respect to every voter's vote. So applying monotonicity between Q and R, we conclude that the mechanism must in fact continue to output A, which is something that it was doing on the profile Q. Right? So that is your contradiction because applying monotonicity between P and R, you see that the mechanism should output B, but applying monotonicity between Q and R, you see that it should also output A, which is a contradiction, yeah? So you also get unanimity from strategy proofness and ontoness, which is, I think, yeah, just interesting way of relating uh, different properties. Now remember that our original statement was about um, combining the properties of being onto strategy proof and non-dictatorial and saying that that's an impossible combination, right? So again, I'm going to try and illustrate this with an example and I, I did think that I'll do a proof with two voters, but depending on how this goes, that is something that I may um, actually defer to a tutorial problem, so we'll, we'll see. But at least to get some intuition, let me just put down an example here. So, Okay, so uh, let's consider these two profiles here, where C is ranked at the bottom, 
for both the voters. So I'm really focusing on profiles with only two voters and three candidates, which is kind of the minimally interesting instance. If there's only one voter, then the voter is trivially a dictator. And we know that we need at least three candidates to play around with from the assumptions of the statement. So it's really um, the smallest kind of example that we can consider that would still be interesting. So um, in the first profile, so again, we are considering, I mean, in the backdrop, it's always a onto and strategy proof function that we are considering which by now we also know satisfies also monotonicity and Pareto optimality or it satisfies unanimity. Okay, so, um, so in the first profile being unanimous, can the outcome, can the outcome be C? Can the outcome of this function be C? So C is ranked at the bottom um, by both the voters. So since all voters prefer A to C and all voters prefer B to C as well, I mean on both of these counts you cannot output C, right? So we know that it is between A and B. And now I'm going to say suppose the outcome is A, okay? Then in the second profile where A was demoted to the bottom position by the second voter, Can this outcome be B? So just think about everything you have at your disposal. So, so can we again say that it must be A or B and in particular it cannot be C? Why can't it be C in the second profile? B is, ne okay, uh, so C is never anyone's first choice and in particular both voters prefer B over C and the rule is unanimous, right? So it cannot output C. So again we know that it's between A and B but in the previous profile the mechanism outputs A. So in this new profile can it output B? So Remember that the mechanism is strategy proof, so do you see a contradiction based on that? Right, so the second voter has an incentive to deviate from the profile P to the profile Q because she likes B better than A. And the second profile is giving, uh, giving her a better outcome from that point of view. And the first voter's vote has not changed. So, so by changing her vote from BAC to BCA, she can extract a better, better outcome from the mechanism. So the mechanism in the interests of being strategy proof is compelled to output A here. Because of unanimity, it cannot output C. And because of strategy proofness, it cannot output B. So it must output A. So intuitively, notice what is happening is that the mechanism is spewing out A in spite of one of the voters ranking A at the bottom. So we have again, here we see that A is a polarizing candidate. One of the voters has ranked it at the top and the other voter has ranked it at the bottom, which seems to indicate that in some sense, the first voter is a pivotal voter for the candidate A. Right? Because even though the other candidate is saying no dice, sorry, the other voter is saying no dice for the candidate A. She has ranked A at the bottom. But by placing A at the top, the first voter managed to force the mechanism to output A. Right? Um, again, this is not a proof, but essentially um, what, I mean, so, so this proof at this point is in spirit not very different from the kind of arguments that we were making uh, in the case of Arrow's theorem. But essentially, I mean, you could also derive this from monotonicity, right? So if, if A is the best outcome for one individual and is the worst outcome for another, as long as this individual votes 
um, and, and the mechanism outputs A. As long as this individual keeps A at the top, whatever else happens, I mean A's positions are only going to improve if the profile changes anymore, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you have a situation where there is one voter who places A at the top and the remaining voters place A at the bottom and the mechanism outputs A, then this voter is pivotal or dictatorial with respect to the candidate A because in any other profile, if you, I mean, if F is giving you A here in any other profile, A's situation either stays as bad as it is now or it only improves. So by monotonicity, you continue to output A. I mean, as long as the first voter uh, continues to just say A is my favorite, right? Uh, then basically this was the worst case profile where you manage to derive that F outputs A. So in any other profile, F will continue to output A and therefore, it's really only the first voter's vote that counts as far as A is concerned. So what you really need to show is that, again, similar to before, you need to show that you can actually find these pivotal voters for every candidate and that these pivotal voters coincide and they are essentially the same voter, which will lead you to your dictator. And all of this can, of course, be made quite formal. Um, I'll try to break this down a little bit so that um, uh, so that it can be addressed as a as a nice tutorial problem. So it should not be it should not be hard to uh, formalize this argument based on um, the the practice that we already had with Arrow's theorem. So I just want to spend a few more minutes talking about uh, you know where we stand uh, and what are the consequences um, or rather what are the workarounds that we can imagine for um, uh, for this impossibility result. So we saw Arrow's theorem and then we say, okay, maybe welfare functions are, uh, you know, too demanding a situation. So we relaxed our setting even and came down to choice functions. But even in the context of choice functions, we have seen one fairly dramatic impossibility result which says that with ontoness, which is a very fundamental property, and strategy proofness, which again, just like IIA, you could sit and debate till late hours about whether strategy proofness is something that you really want to demand or whether it is too strong. Um, I think some of you already have an intuition for why it's perhaps too strong a demand to make. But if you do ask for these things, then again, you are stuck with dictatorships. So uh, now we really must uh, sit down and think about what, what is the next best thing that we can hope for. Is this to say that every reasonable mechanism, which is to say, let's say, every mechanism that is on to must either sacrifice strategy proofness or sacrifice being reasonable, which is, I mean, uh, to say that um, uh, it ends up being a dictatorship. Of course, that's what the statement of the theorem is saying, uh, but, let me propose a couple of workarounds that actually do not really work. One is to say that you move beyond deterministic functions, right? So you introduce some randomization, so you expand the class of things that you're looking at, and maybe you can actually take some help from randomization to sort of say uh, that, that you can do better than, than what the impossibility result claims. And uh, I'll not say, I'll not make the formal claim here, but it turns out that randomization is something that is not very helpful in this setting. The other kind of thing that you might ask is, again, going back to this collection of profiles, so let's say, right. Um, so strategy proofness is basically saying that no voter has any incentive to manipulate in any profile, right? That's, uh, I mean, now that I'm putting it that way, it's sounding pretty strong as well. So let's just say that, uh, let's just mark the profiles which are vulnerable to manipulation by some voters and let's mark the profiles which are not vulnerable to strategic behavior. So these are the strong ones. Of course, this breakup depends on the mechanism F, right? 
So fix a mechanism F and look at how it partitions the space of profiles into those that are vulnerable and those that are not vulnerable. So I go to a profile and I ask, well, is there any voter here who has an incentive to deviate to some other profile? If yes, then I flag it as something that's a dangerous profile or it's not a good profile for this mechanism. And the green ones are where you see that they are not vulnerable, right? And what we are saying is that we declare F to be um, a bad mechanism or a mechanism which is not strategy proof if there is even just one red profile, right? Even, even then we are unhappy, right? But perhaps we can be a little more um, relaxed about this whole thing and say that I'm happy if there are a small number of these flagged profiles, right? So if by and large uh, on most profiles the mechanism is not vulnerable, that's probably good enough for me, right? Yeah? Okay, so it turns out that this is also something that uh, people have investigated more closely and this is what is called um, quantitative versions of the gibbert satter white result. And the, the attempt is to sort of understand the degree of vulnerability to manipulation via with the extent to which F is close to being a dictatorship, okay? And the overall theme is that, um, so for a dictatorship, the set of red profiles is simply empty, right? There is, um, there are no vulnerable profiles at all because in every profile, nobody has any incentive to manipulate, right? Now, if you want, the smaller you want the red set to be, the closer you have to go towards being a dictatorship. And this is something that can be, that can be made precise. Um, I don't want to, um, again, state the actual uh, theorem here, but I just want to say what I mean by distance from a dictatorship. That's because there are many notions of distance that you can define between functions, so you can, um, here the distance, uh, at least in some versions of the theorem, the notion of distance is simply the number of places where you disagree, right? So you can, okay, so let me just get rid of this. So a mechanism F is something that simply partitions the profile into at most M classes, right? So these are, uh, so let's say you have candidates A, B, C, D. So here are the profiles. These are the profiles where C is winning. Uh, the top left are the profiles where B is winning. So every mechanism is just a partition of the profiles. It's a labeling of the profiles with candidates, right, based on who is winning in that profile. So I've just collected together in this region, I've collected all the profiles where B emerges as the winner with respect to F and so on. So if you give me two mechanisms, uh, let's say F and G, the distance between these two mechanisms is the number of profiles on which F and G report a different winner, okay? That is their disagreement distance. So let's say that we have F which comes up with this partition and let's say we have G that comes up with, maybe it's exactly the same here. So this is a slightly different partition. You can see that, uh, you know, on, on these profiles, F is reporting B, but G is reporting A and so on, right? So there are profiles where these two mechanisms uh, feel differently about who should win, okay? And that's the distance between two mechanisms. It's the number of profiles on which they have different output. And, um, of course, dictatorship is not just one mechanism, it's a collection of, if you fix the number of voters, it's a collection of n different mechanisms. So the distance, so your proposed mechanism, the distance from dictatorship is basically which dictatorship are you the closest to, that is your distance, okay? So you can also define, again, I think, maybe I'm um, going through this too fast, but So dictatorship is not a single mechanism, right? There is one for every voter. If you are going to mimic the first voter, 
then that is one mechanism. If you're going to mimic the second voter, that's another mechanism and so on. So, uh, so this is a bunch of, this is a bunch of mechanisms and you know that anything that is onto and strategy proof actually coincides with this class. And if you are a hopeful mechanism that's trying to uh, optimize the number of profiles which are vulnerable to manipulation, well, I'm going to look at how far are you from each of these dictatorship functions and I'm going to say that your distance from dictatorship is the smallest of these distances. Okay. It sort of makes sense because you're saying that there is a dictatorship with respect to which you are almost in agreement with this dictatorship then that's, uh, that's what I'm going to count as the distance. And um, as I said, the spirit of the quantitative version is to say that um, the more you want to uh, avoid the flagged profiles, the fewer vulnerable profiles you want to have, the closer and closer you must tread into the domain of dictatorial functions. Okay, so um, so if you if you are an interesting mechanism that you know is is looks very different from any dictatorial functions, the price you have to pay is that you must suffer a substantial proportion of vulnerable profiles. And I think people have really dug fairly deep into this because even within the vulnerable profiles, you could imagine having degrees of vulnerability. Maybe there are profiles in which only one or two voters have an incentive to deviate versus there are profiles where many, many voters have an incentive to deviate and things like this. Uh, but at this point, uh, the literature does get fairly um, um, intricate. But it's also very interesting. So the space of profiles that I'm talking about has some very interesting geometric interpretations and their relationships to an area called the analysis of Boolean functions. So it's all very, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, it's also well beyond the scope of our current discussion. But if anyone is interested, we're going to put up references uh, on, um, on, on the website for today's schedule. So do check it out. There is, uh, there is uh, a lot going on um, in this context. Okay? Uh, but as I said, these were two of the things that, so the quantitative versions and uh, appealing to randomization are two things that seem natural, but they also don't work. So it seems like my narrative is just getting sadder and sadder by the minute. So we're going to try and see if we can pull ourselves out of this by looking at things that potentially do work, which is to say that, um, so when we come back, we will look at a couple of approaches that turn out to be actually reasonable. One is to say that maybe we don't really be, we don't really need to worry about the space of all profiles. This is a humongous space, and maybe we are just um, asking for too much. So maybe there's a, there's a little thing that we can carve out for ourselves where it all looks nice and green. And maybe we can carve out a space which is actually also sensible, meaning that we might say that most instances that you deal with in the real world, most profiles that come up in real world scenarios actually have the structure that we identify. So if we can do that, then that's, that's something that would be a reasonable success, I think. So we're going to see if we can carve out a structure that, that, that makes sense uh, in, in this fashion. And the other thing is to say that, well, when we talk about strategy proofness, we are giving a lot of power to the manipulator. In particular, it's one thing to say that you are vulnerable to manipulation on paper, right? If we go back to the picture that your question prompted, so here, for instance, here is a voter I who is probably thinking about manipulation, but A, we are assuming that the manipulator actually has complete information about what all the other voters are up to, which is a pretty strong assumption. Uh, there may be all powerful manipulators in some small voting applications, like let's say it's a small committee that's trying to uh, figure out who wins the Oscars, then maybe you could assume that they, they, they are all friends and they know, uh, they roughly have a sense of what everyone else is going to be voting. But in most larger scale applications, this is not such a reasonable assumption. Uh, so, and the other assumption that we are making is that it's just enough for us to know that manipulation is possible. But for manipulation to actually become an issue, 
uh, in real world instances, you you would want the manipulator to have a systematic way of figuring out how to manipulate. Just knowing that you're sitting in a profile that is vulnerable is not enough. The manipulator needs to be able to figure out what I should do to be able to actually successfully derive a better outcome. So we have been, again, working this out in ad hoc fashion for a few examples. We did that a little bit yesterday. But um, coming up with algorithms for manipulation may not be easy. And that is our other glimmer of hope that maybe even though it's a problem on paper, in practice, manipulators may have a hard time figuring out what is a good strategy. So those are the two things that we will uh, come back and talk about on the other side of the way.